All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, appreciate everybody taking their time out of their busy schedule to attend this little webinar and, and to talk about the CFAT2 program. Uh, I have a lot of distinguished guests that are going to do most of the talking today. Uh, Dr. Amy Hagerman, uh, who is the OSU uh, policy specialist, uh, AgiCom policy specialist, and, and kind of the right-hand person uh, that we lean on when it comes to ag policy and all these government programs. And then Madeline Elwine, or Maddie Elwine, I guess, it, and she works for the state FSA office here in Oklahoma. And then I, I kind of roped into, you know, Angie Bierman from, uh, she's the county director for both Pottawatomie and Pontotoc County, which is my, one of my, the counties that I cover. So, and then they're, they're all three going to give a little bit of talk and then I'm going to, I'll, I'll wrap it up towards the end. So uh, again, I ask everybody, if you've got any questions, you can tap them, uh, type them into the chat room. Uh, and then we will get to the questions, you know, as, as they come in. So with that, Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, JJ, if you could enable screen sharing, I would appreciate it. So we can throw these slides up here. We still got a few more people jumping on here. So as JJ said, my name is Amy Hagerman. I'm the state ag and food policy specialist here in Oklahoma. And what that means is that I track programs like this and try to provide just information on you know, generally what the program is and, and who can apply for it. And what I'm gonna do is start off with just a broad overview of how we got here to CFAP2. Uh, and then what that's gonna do is really set it up for our colleagues over in Farm Service Agency to really go down into the details of exactly what you need to know to apply for this program. Uh, so just looking back, back in March, the CARES Act passed, which set aside $9.5 billion for direct producer payments, plus an additional $14 billion in CCC, or Commodity Credit Corps, funds. If you've ever participated in a disaster program with USDA FSA before, it has probably come out of the CCC funds. And that differentiation between CARES and CCC was pretty important in the first round of CFAP, less so this time around. There was a little bit of a delay in CCC funds availability. Some of that money didn't roll over to USDA until later in the summer. Um, and so a lot of the program we're seeing right now is associated with CCC, and that created some restrictions on the crop side, less of an issue for, um, for you guys as livestock producers. Additional funds have been proposed, uh, and you may have heard that in the news. That's not the money that, that this program is coming out of. However, there was a continuing resolution, which is the, the federal budget that was passed that goes out until December 11th. That's actually pretty important when we start thinking about the dates uh, for applying for this program as well. But that continuing resolution included CCC authorization. That really allows USDA to just hit the ground running on, on getting this program administered. Looking back at CFAP 1, this opened May 26th and went through September 11th. I know you guys have kind of a lot of back and forth about what's included, what's not included as uh, small ruminant producers. And the majority of those payments in that first round of CFAP really went to cattle producers, both nationally and here in Oklahoma. Nationally, uh, 638,000, a little over 638,000 applications, about $10 billion in funds that were paid out through CFAP 1. Now, if you kind of go back to that, that pot of money that we had just talked about that was set aside in CARES, it tells you a little bit about why we had this second round of the CFAP uh, program. And really the doors opened a little bit in terms of what was eligible in this because this is about continuing market disruptions uh, as compared to the CFAP 1. So CFAP 2, it opened September 21st. It closes December 11th. And again, kind of I talked about that that continuing resolution also goes out to December 11th. If if we don't have a budget or a second continuing resolution when that December 11th date rolls around, um, our colleagues at USDA might, may end up being out of the office until they do have a budget in place. Uh, so I would really be very conscious of that December 11th timeline. Don't, don't wait. Uh, local FSA offices around the state, anywhere in the country, maybe at different levels of public access 
depending on where you are. So call your office, find out where they're at, find out how to apply for this program in a way that works best for that office and that staff. Also pointing out that we do have an online application portal this time around. I think that's a really cool uh, thing that, that gives you sort of a, a peek at the, the program. Another thing, if you uh, interacted with the CFAP 1 program, we really emphasized that that was an interim final rule. It was subject to some changes that could still happen to the program. And we did see those changes in the summer as the rule evolved, as the program evolved over time. The CFAP 2 rule though, this is a final rule. And that means that nationally, this program is going to be administered kind of as specified in this final rule. Um, so uh, I don't expect to see changes in this program between now and December 11th. That is not to say we won't see other kinds of funding availability, but it will probably be under other kinds of authorizations than the CARES Act that this one is, is based on. There we go. Um, there's a lot of help online for this program. So farmers.gov slash CFAP, I think it's a really useful website. Um, if you have other kinds of commodities other than sheep and goats, there's a great uh, tool here that you could kind of see how you would apply for different sorts of commodities, what would be eligible. There's also multiple ways to apply for this program. That's why I emphasize it's important to call your FSA office, find out what's working best for them at their office. There is a, a tool that JJ will talk about a little bit later that's a spreadsheet based tool to get an estimate of what your payment might look like. If you're just interested in how different kinds of commodities uh, are, are calculated in different ways, you can find a lot of information on this website. And different commodities are calculated in very different ways this time around. It's not that any one is that complex, but if you have multiple commodities that fall in different categories, it can get a little, little confusing. And finally, there's just some great general information about the program if you'd like to learn more. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Maddie Elwine, who will walk you through some of those finer points of the program. I'm gonna stop sharing because I believe she has some slides that she's gonna pop up there. And, and I'm very happy to answer any questions, but I really think a lot of your questions are, are gonna get hit by our colleagues here in FSA. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm not a great multitasker. Sorry, I have to do one thing at a time. My name is Maddie Elon. I'm the state outreach coordinator for the Oklahoma Farm Service Agency. Um, and with me is also Angie. She is the County Executive Director for Pontotoc and Pottawatomie Counties. So um, a couple, three main things about CFAP, um, and Amy kind of hit this a little bit, is December 11th is a big deadline. Um, we're kind of considering this as a hard set in stone deadline. It will be easier for your county offices and then the quicker that you get paid, if you get into the offices sooner rather than later. So we're really encouraging people to come and um, sign up uh, for, their, for their CFAP application as soon as possible um, because the continuing resolution may or may not happen. And so we're just gonna pretend like it won't. So we make sure that everybody can get the funds when the funds are there. Um, Another big thing about CFAP that is different, CFAP 2, that is different than CFAP 1, is that breeding stock is no longer included. This is a big, big change from last year, or from the last CFAP, excuse me. Uh, breeding stock is not included, but if you, for instance, if you harvest or you farm wheat, wheat is included. So that's kind of one of the biggest things to remember about your CFAP. Um, application. This is a self-certification program and so you're going to select a date for your highest or for your highest owned inventory between the dates of April 16th and August 31st of 2020. So you're going to pick any select date um, and if you had if you had a doe and she had she was pregnant but she did, never birthed yet you can count her she still counts but um, as soon as she kids, she's out. So 
Um, Maddie, but you're gonna, you, Maddie go I'm, just gonna correct, I'm just going to correct you a little bit. You're using uh, GOAT terminology, and GOATs are based on sales, not on not inventory numbers. Oh, yep, you're correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you, JJ. Uh, so if you farm cattle, sorry, and you have a heifer that hasn't had a calf yet and it's not on the ground, you're just going to um, use your heifer before she calves and then she can count. So with your sales commodities, eligible sales uh, include sales of raw commodities ground by the producer and any portion of sales derived from adding value to the com commodity such as processing packaging. So um, Angie can kind of give you a real life example on this one, but that's kind of the definition that we have in our books about what's an eligible sale commodity. Um, and finally, one of my points, um, overview points before Angie digs in a little bit deeper, is the online application is not working consistently for us. Um, so we really encourage you to contact your county offices and to speak with them and see if you can go into their office. Our counties are being very creative and they are having meetings outside um, if you're not allowed inside of the office. And so your county may be doing the same thing. So we're really encouraging you to pick up the phone, make a phone call with your county and um, see what they can get set up for you. So uh, just to recap, December 11th is a big deadline. It's very important um, that you guys try and get there as soon as possible. And Angie will give you some of her experiences with the county operations. All right, thanks, Maddie. Um, like they said, my name is Angie Beerman. I'm the County Executive Director in Pottawatomie and Pontotoc counties. And we've been extremely busy administering the program. Um, JJ, do you want me to give some specifics throughout all the program or just Goats and you, go, you go ahead and hit the highlights on some of the other ones, but the, but okay. the sheep and goat is where most of these guys are going to want to have questions in. Okay. So one thing that we need to make clear is that you have to be in the business of farming at the time you apply. This isn't, I sold out, but I owned them during that time. You have to currently be in the business to be eligible this time around. Uh, if you're a contract grower, you're not gonna be eligible this time. You have to own the livestock to be eligible. Um, alongside breeding stock, which we've defined as a bull that is currently servicing a female or a female that has had a calf. So a cow would not be eligible. Like Maddie said, bred heifers are eligible as long as they haven't had their baby yet along with your steers and calves and things. Um, as well as Horses are not eligible. Companion animals are not eligible. Raised livestock for hunting or game purposes um, are not eligible. Um, and let's see, on um, the sales commodities, the biggest thing we have in Southern Oklahoma on this would be pecans. Um, there are other fruits and vegetables that are eligible. Um, this also goes into the goats. They have to be sold for meat. Um, this is different than the cattle part of the program where we count by head. Um, goats sold for meat. I also saw in my handbook that goat milk is eligible. I uh, haven't had any of that yet. But on your goats or on your, if you have bison, buffalo, beefalo, other animals that are sold for the, all those Fs, the feed fiber for the feathers and fur. <laughs> Excuse me, that's a fun one. Um, if you have any of those crops, or animals, um, you would give us your 2019 calendar year sales, the dollar amount that you sold in the calendar year of 2019. That might be a 2018 crop that was sold in 2019. If you have a 2019 crop that was sold in 2020 or animals, um, if it's a 2020 income that's not on the program, it's 2019. Um, now, Angie, isn't it correct if they have no sales in 2019, but sales in 2020, they can use those sales? If they have never raised that crop right. prior to 2020, they can be right. considered a new producer and use 2020 sales, yes. Okay. But if they harvested something two or three or four years ago and then didn't again until this year, that does not consider them a new producer. 
Let me ask you one um, question that, I, that yes, I've sir. got got from time to time. So let's say I'm a goat producer that I, or sheep producer that I've never ever darkened the door of the FSA office, but, but still can I can't, can I still come in and take advantage of this program? Well, you can't come in, but you can take advantage of our program. <laughs> well, I, metaphorically, can I call, can I call yes. you and take advantage of this program? Yes. If you have never participated with us before, expect a few questions because we will need all of your personal information, your name, address, social security number, uh, preferably a cell phone number and an email address if you've got it. Um, this does not require us to link you to a farm at this point. So we're just getting your basic information. Then we would take your application with a few eligibility forms and set up direct deposit for your payment. So we encourage new producers to join as well. Um, we do request that you call the office. Um, when we have applications that are done online, there's usually, I mean, some people get it right and we're grateful for that. There's a lot that may not quite understand the guidelines or put something in a wrong box. Um, I've instructed my employees to contact every person that applies online to verify their numbers. Um, this thing of not using breeding stock has kind of got confusing to some people. Um, as well as on the specialty crops, I have people listing their calf sales and that's not what that line is for that's for like your meat goats or your other crops that are based on your sales um so we would request that you call the office um just so that we make sure we get it right the first time and save a lot of confusion um on acre-based crops uh, as maddie said wheat is eligible this time that would be wheat for grazing or not wheat for grazing excuse me wheat for grain or wheat for forage any grazing crops are not eligible on this program. Um, and as Amy said, if you go on the CFAP website, the farmers.gov slash CFAP, you can find a full list of what eligible crops are. Um, the list is long. Um, but those are paid two different ways. Um, and for this time we're doing the, what was that? Oh, hi. Um, we also have flat rate crops, so crops like alfalfa and canola um, are eligible on that part. Um, the sheep will go like the cattle by head and no breeding stock, just your babies um, or young animals. Um, I think that about covers most of the notes that I made. Um, one thing I might also mention um, would be on the crop part, um, it does pull from your 2020 acreage report. So if you don't have an acreage report on file, you'll want to get with the office and do that. We're not charging a late fee. If the acreage report is just being used for CFAP, we're waiving that fee. So that's something to consider as well. If you've got one of the eligible crops and it's not listed in our office, we'll, you'll want us to know that so we can make sure to cover everything that you're eligible for. Think that's about it. I was kind of writing down some questions that I that we heard from um, a couple webinars ago and some people are mistaking that if they've applied for CFAP 1 then they're automatically enrolled for CFAP 2. That's not the case. This is a second program and a second application is needed. So if you um, and also vice versa if you did not sign up for CFAP 1 you are still eligible for CFAP 2. So there are no pre prerequisite programs with the FSA prior to your CFAP2 application, uh, which is just kind of something to keep in mind that with CFAP1, this isn't gonna just automatically put you in for CFAP2. All right. So there, again, if you got any questions, just type them in the chat box. If we don't see any questions, we're gonna keep on going on. And so I'm going to share my screen and hopefully y'all can see the the cfap uh website amy can we see that cfap website all right guys I, i'm going to tell you so i've been in extension a long time done a lot of uh 
USDA and FSA programs, and this website is outstanding as far as being able to answer questions and stuff. And so it's it's something if you're tech savvy and and, and use the internet, it's something that'd be easily done. And so the, you know this this is it's at that uh, farmers.gov forward slash CFAP. This is the first page that you're going to get get there. And so. And you scroll down just a little bit, and there's this el the eligibility found commodities finder that we've talked about a couple of times. And I, I'm just going to demonstrate. I click on start. It's going to bring up another little page, and then right right here, select commodities. I put in here, and I'm just going to type in goat. There's our choices. So I select goats, see results, and there it tells me goats are eligible. Payments for goats will be based on 2019 sales, and here's the breakdown of this and so for goats example <clears throat> if you sold let you know up to forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and if you sold more than fifty thousand dollars worth of goats i need to visit with you a little bit and see what you're doing because i'm not never reached quite that high uh but what what it is is you'll get 10.6 percent of your sales back as a payment so easy calculation if i sold a thousand dollars worth of goats i'm gonna get a a hundred and six dollars back so that's kind of where it is. And so I could type in different commodities. I'm just going to type in a, a, a completely different one here, pecans, because we have pecans here in Oklahoma. I can look. Are pecans eligible? And they are. And again, it's a sales-based uh, commodity. So uh, that's a really good tool uh, to use. I'm going to go back to the, the main website here and then just go past it. And right here, at, as Angie and Maddie have told you uh, they're having a little difficulty uh, with this uh, payment calculator. Uh, and so I, I tell people they, they can use this payment calculator, just kind of get an idea and estimate. Just got to remember that no matter what this calculator tells you, FSA will tell you the real amount. And so, you know, if it comes up with a million dollars and Angie tells me I only get a hundred, I got to go with what Angie tells me, not what the calculator tells me because chances are I did something wrong. So, but all I do is I can click on this you know, uh, payment outcake, and it, it's going to see right. It kind of comes up right here, and you have to download it uh, from the website. And so I click on it, and it downloads it. And then Amy, you have to tell me. Make sure that the uh, did that come? Did that come it's the up? Website or still. Yeah, it's still just web, okay. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a second, and then I'm going to go back to sharing and share this screen. Now that should be the, the spreadsheet, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So all right, this is the spreadsheet. The thing you gotta make sure you do if you're gonna play with this is you gotta make sure you enable the content. But once you can do, you know, again, if we're gonna use this to help fill out our application, we would put our name and stuff in here and, and we could put it all, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is how I did it. Uh, uh, I did mine early with with mine. I filled it all out, and it worked right. It worked okay with me. But I'm going to scroll down. It's got everything on here that's eligible. So you got to kind of scroll down here through here and find what you're looking for. So we're not talking about dairy. We're not talking about eggs or broiler production. Uh, we're talking about the livestock part of it. And so here you see sheep. And so again, we only can count the non-breeders. So if I had ten sheep. Uh, and the highest inventory between April 16th, and it says September 1, but Maddie, isn't it August 31 is the dead, last deadline for the inventory date? Is I'm correct, I think. They're shaking their heads, yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So August so, 31st. August 31st. So so what I have to do is I have to look at my inventory records that I have on, on, my, on my place, and I look, okay, let's just say July 15th, I had 10 non-breeders, so I can put in 10. Hit, hit enter and there it shows I get $27 per head uh, for those 10 head and so it calculates the total for me and again I can play around and change this you know but again and so I always tell people you know this is reason you know we preach that records have been are real important so now when you go back and you find uh, find the records and when your highest inventory number is uh, and then but now for goats it's a little different now, JJ, before you move forward, we've had a lot of questions about what kinds of records do you need to have and how long do you need to keep them. It's self-certification, 
but Maddie and Angie, um, there's some need to kind of have some records behind that that could be produced, right? Yes. Um, I was going to jump in and say we've had several that might have sold their calf crop or a portion of their calf crop during this period because they held off earlier in the year. Those can be counted if the date you choose for your highest inventory is prior to the date you sold your calves. So you would have still had them on your farm. You can potentially count what you sold. I always try to say, did you have more babies after you sold the ones that you sold? You know, where was your number higher? Um, if you do include calves that were sold, you would need to keep your sales tickets. Um, so that if I come out and count what's currently on your farm, you can justify where the ones are that are not there now. Um, there's other things in our handbook, such as chattel inspections, um, records, breeding records. Um, I don't have the list in front of me, but there's a nice list of different options for records, but yes, we can spot check up to three years after the program. So it is recommended in our handbook to keep any records for three years, just in case you happen to get pulled for spot check. And you gotta pick a single day, right? Like I, yes. I can say, yeah. this is my highest of this kind of animal, <laughs> highest of this kind of animal. We gotta pick one day for everything that's eligible, right? Yes, and you don't have to tell us the date that you pick. That does not go on our application. I've had a lot of people say, I chose this day, okay, that's okay. But um, yes, one specific day. And Angie, sort of the, the term I keep hearing is verifiable records is the term that yes. keeps getting thrown out there, so yes. So when Yeah, we, it can't just be writing on a piece of paper saying I had 20. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably not gonna fly. So so that's that's the inventory number for goats. You would go down to the sales commodity and it and this is one with it's a little you know at first is a little kind of uh, not tricky is not the right word but you you know you're gonna put your goats in what it says other livestock and it says excluding excluding breeding livestock and again it says 2019 revenue so and let's just say we sold ten thousand dollars worth of goats and there you see i get check uh, you know is estimating is a thousand and sixty bucks and that's because I have payments of less of 50,000. If I go over 50,000, the percentage goes down and it's, and it's kind of a little tricky. It's not on the first 10, you know, the first 50,000, the percentage goes down on the amount above $50,000. So, but again, if you're over $50,000, uh, congratulations, you're doing a great job. Uh, so, uh, so we'll, and, and if you've got any, you know, questions or something other, you know, just, you can get in touch with your local FSA office. And, that, and that's what I, I, I will tell you is uh, your local FSA office folks, they're there to help you. Again, the only, the only problem they've got right now is this, their offices may, are not open to the general public. So they have to be, you know, kind of call. You can't just walk up and, and visit with them. So, so anytime I need to, uh, this is the first time I've seen Angie in six months, but we've talked on the phone several times. So, so uh, but anyway, so that's kind of how it is done. There's other things down here. Uh, you know, down here you see the uh, the uh, commodity crops, and again, if you've got stuff like wheat and soybeans and corn, uh, I'm gonna tell you you can play with this a little bit if you want to. But to be honest with you, you need to go to your FSA office because all the numbers that you're gonna need to report are there in their office, and so it, it takes them all of about five minutes to download those numbers for you. So, the software automatically pulls that from our acreage reporting software. So that's why we have to have that on file, um, not just written on a piece of paper. Right, it's very good. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing there. I know we've got some questions. We'll see what are, are some things in the chat here. All right, yep. so in the chat box, uh, Angie and Madeline have, uh, Maddie have put their uh, uh, email addresses and then and the phone numbers. And then Amy's put the uh, address in there. So guys, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Again, one of the probably the easier programs. I told Maddie and